Well, for those of you that uh, may uh, be newer, my name is Bo Oswald. It's been a minute since I have preached. I knew that if Joe kept asking and I kept telling him no, he was going to stop asking. So here I am today. You're out of preachers. Everybody else is out of town. So you've got me this morning. If you'll turn to Psalm 126, we're going to find ourselves in the, uh, in the Psalm of Ascent, the Song of Ascents this morning. And I am uh, I'm honored to, to stand before you today. If you'll look at Psalm 126 with me, before uh, we read it, I want to draw your attention to just a few things. Uh, It's a short psalm, as some of these have been. It's a psalm that we find in two different parts. If you look at this psalm and you look at the first three verses, it's apparent that the first part of this is a a song of of gratitude. It's expressions of gratitude to God for a past uh, deliverance. It's a memory of a time when God in some powerful way has delivered Israel from her distress. Now, it's not specific enough to tell us exactly what the occasion of the delivery was. Uh, And different commentators and commentaries say different things. John Calvin is certain that this is the deliverance of the children of Israel out of exile from Babylon. And maybe this is Ezra writing this particular psalm. He's looking back to the deliverance of Babylon and he's asking God for deliverance in in a specific time. Uh, A lot of other commentators aren't aren't quite sure about that when this deliverance occurred. They point out, for instance, that even though the language that you see there in verse number 1, and we'll read that in a minute, restored the fortunes, you see that in the first verse, that even that language is used of the deliverance of Israel out of the exile through, the, uh, through Babylon. It's also used in the Old Testament to talk about uh, the restoration of Job's fortune after the assault of Satan had been remedied by God and had been giving blessings back. Many fold over, we're told, what he had lost. But the beautiful thing about that, about the generality of that, is of course this means that this psalm can be applied in a general way to all of God's people. And so it doesn't tell us exactly what the circumstance, what the context is here, and that helps us in terms of of the application to our own lives. So again, those first three verses are uh, looking back to a great deliverance. It's a remembrance. It's, It's a memory. The last three verses, verses 4 to 6, uh, kind of transition into a prayer. A prayer for God to come and to do it again, to give another deliverance. And that's actually the context for this particular psalm. And you can notice how often in the psalms that happens. The psalm starts out one way and it ends a completely different way. And you remember it's the way that the, song, uh, the psalm ends that tells you the context even in the first part of the psalm. So clearly here. We see the psalmist in a situation where he and the people of God in general, whatever the context may be, are in need of deliverance. And so he begins thinking. And what happens? He's recounting the memory of God's past deliverance in the first three verses, and then he prays. He he petitions. He, He pleads. He lifts up a prayer of intercession to God to ask Him for deliverance right now, remembering what God has done before. And so be on the lookout for that as we walk our way, as we look through this together. And so before we read it, I want to pray. I want to ask for God's help and blessing. Would you pray with me, please? God, we know, Father, that as you spoke through this word some 2,500 years ago, God, that you can make it working with the Spirit of God to make it like it was written 25 minutes ago. So I pray, God, that you would give us the eyes to see its beauty, that you would give us the hearts, God, that can receive, God, the the impact and the power, God, that we know that even when we can't see it, you're working. God, even when it seems imperceptible, Father, God, that you're, you're, you're doing a work. And so we praise you, God, as we have sang this morning several times about your goodness. I pray, God, that through the reading and through the exposition, God, through the preaching of your word, God, that you would show us again your goodness, God. And I pray, God, that we would recall to mind all the times that you have been good, that you have caused such goodness in our hearts, God, that it resulted in joy and laughter. So, Lord, I pray that you would just come and speak to us now through your word, by your spirit. And it's all because of the work of Jesus Christ that we pray this prayer. Amen. 
This is God's word. Psalm 126. Read with me. Verse number one. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Now here's this transition. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Geb. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the inspired, perfect word of God. May he write the eternal truths on our hearts. Have you ever had deliverance in your life that was just almost too good to be true? You wondered if maybe you were dreaming, and then years later you looked back on that time. You look back on that time years later when you need to be delivered again, afresh, anew, and you wondered if you would ever feel that way again. Because that memory is, is vivid. You can almost feel it. You can almost taste it. But now the place you're at is so hard, you could... Wonder if, if, if that's ever, if you're going to ever experience that kind of thing again. Uh, again, those of you that have been here a while may have heard this before. Those are some of you that are new or may not have. Uh, our son, uh, Carter, has been through a lot of different health uh, is, issues and difficulties. And particularly in 2009, we had come to a place where I was sitting across from a doctor and he looked at me and he said, Dad, you know, unless, unless Carter has a heart transplant, He's just not going to, to make it very much longer. The heart that he has is not doing the job for his body that it needs to do. And so we need to start thinking about this. My wife is like 47 months pregnant with our twins, okay? And so she is really big pregnant. She's not even there, which is unusual, at the doctor's appointment. And um, so I go home, and I think I actually probably called her, you know, on my flip phone or something like that. And, and was like, you know, sweetheart, this is what the doctor said. And so she, she has the twins, and, and we truck along, and Carter's health did continue to deteriorate. We get to December of 2009. The twins have gotten there, and they're eight weeks old, and we find ourselves packing up uh, and moving to Nashville uh, because Carter had to be admitted to the ICU, and we knew that this process of transplant waiting had begun. Didn't know at the time a soul and so Lindy uh, has Snaggletooth Spencer, and she has these two little babies, and we're just trying to figure out what in the world is going to happen. It seemed like a really dry, a really barren time. We, we didn't see much hope in this situation, but God was working. Even though we didn't see him, he was working. He was, he was about to do something incredible. And so we waited. We waited through Christmas, and we waited through New Year's, we waited through January, and we waited through February and Valentine's Day. We waited through March and watched everybody go to spring break. All the while, Carter's continuously deteriorating, still in ICU, never left ICU. We get to uh, April. Easter was in April that year. I was pastor at the time of a church here in Octavia Hall County. And so I would go home periodically and, and preach. And uh, this particular Sunday was Easter Sunday. So I took the twins, went home. Lindy stayed at the hospital, of course, uh, with Carter. And the Lord just in, in, in laid on my heart uh, that weekend. You know what? We need to have just concerted, focused, somebody all the time praying for Carter. Carter had a considerable uh, following on Caring Bridge. Uh, if you were in Starkville at the time, there was a pretty good chance that you prayed for Carter at some point before you ever knew us. Um, and so I just inquired, I, I pled for the people on Caring Bridge to, to start a, a prayer uh, chain and that lasted 24 hours. And so that's what we did. Started the night of Easter, it went to the next day. We had been waiting over four months at this point for Carter to receive a heart, knowing that we were just living on borrowed time, that he was living on borrowed time. It seemed like a hopeless time. It, it seemed like everything was stacked against us, that we were going to run out. But we prayed, and, and we beseeched God. And somebody all the time in 30-minute increments for 24 hours was praying for Carter. And after four months of waiting, and then focused prayer for that 24 hours, within two days after that happened, we got a call and said, guess what, Carter's got a heart. And so I can remember sitting on the steps of, of the missionary house that we were living there in Nashville 
I remember laughing. I remember laughing through tears. I remember laughing because it seemed like a dream. It seemed just too good to be true that God had answered that in that sort of way that He had made His presence and His Spirit and His power so clearly known. Just as we ask Him to do. A lot of years has, has passed since then. A lot of things has happened since then. He's had cancer. We've had multiple uh, parents and, and grandparents that have passed away. And you kind of get to a place where you ever wonder, can you ever have that experience again? Can you ever have that feeling again? You can picture in your heart's memory the feelings of that old deliverance that silently cried out, God, would you do it again? Would you please do it again? I need you as much now, if not more, than I did then. I need this deliverance. I need it so bad, especially after the last couple of years. I know that that's been me. That's what this psalm is about. He says, remember, and I can remember, remember that the Lord delivered Remember sometimes that we could hardly open our mouths and speak in the way that he did it. But these deliverance doesn't mean that that was a one and done thing, that it didn't ever need to happen again. And that's what this psalm is about. Because this psalm is a memory that is turned into prayer. I want you to think for a minute. It's a memory that's turned into prayer. You know, what we often do, the memory is there, it's kind of faded, the vividness of it is not quite what it used to be, but the memory is there and it turns into nostalgia or cinnamon or whatever, and, but for whatever reason, we don't let it take us all the way to prayer. And what this psalm is stating here is just like a testimony saying, don't let these memories of God's goodness, of the hope that you had in the Lord, fade without moving on to prayer. Because if he was faithful then, he will be faithful to you again. And you should be overwhelmed continuously at his deliverance. And so the psalmist, in this hard time, the time again is not specified here. We'll get to talk about some of the hints when we get to verses 4 to 6. But the psalmist in this time of difficulty begins to reflect on that past deliverance. And as he reflects on that past deliverance, and you see this in the first three verses, he reflects on the Lord's effect, his, his stunning restoration of the hearts of his people. And there are a few things in particular that stand out to me as, as, as I look at these words. First of all, in verse number one, look again there. This is what he said. He says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. He uses the word dream there. Have you ever had one of those experiences? I just kind of described one of mine. There's times when, 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 when your dreams were so vivid that you wondered if they were real. But this is a time that what is happening is so stunning, it's so overwhelming, that you begin to think in the other direction. Is, is this a dream? Is this really happening? Don't pinch me because I don't want to wake up. Could have the Lord have delivered this in, in such an incredible, overwhelming way? And the psalmist says that this restoration was so surprising, so overwhelming, that like they were like those who were dreaming. Couldn't believe that it was true. It felt almost too good to be true. And then he says there was a second effect. You see this in verse number 2. Look there. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. So whereas we were burdened in our distress, maybe with hopelessness and despair, maybe even bitterness. I know I felt some bitterness in those four months that we waited to the point that the only thing that we could do was choke through our, our, our throats was our tears and our cries. But those very same mouths were filled with laughter and with joy. We didn't maybe think that we could laugh that way again. We didn't have that kind of joy. We didn't think maybe that we would ever smile that way again. We didn't think we would ever have that kind of joy again. We thought we were past that. Maybe just too much water under the bridge has come about. That it couldn't happen. And then the Lord delivered. And there was laughter. And there was joy. And not only that, look at the second part of verse number 2. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. This is one of the most incredible parts of this. It results in the unbelievers, in the nations, the other nations, not Israel, testifying to the Lord's power in His people. Don't you love that? Don't you, don't you love when fellow believers have a deliverance like this? 
And unbelievers see such power of God that they wonder what is going on. I can vividly remember various family members, uh, college professors that I had, other acquaintances that were following Carter's story very faithfully, you know, uh, saying, you know, I I'm not a religious person, but I just don't know any other way to explain this, what has happened. Th this has got to be God, which opened up incredible conversations. It was an opportunity to exalt the Lord, and we did that to hundreds and sometimes thousands of people who would view Carter's Cambridge page every day. Listen, church, let me tell you something. Please listen to me. I say this out of love with my heart. Your trials and your distresses and my trials and my distresses do not belong to me alone. Your trials and distresses, they don't belong to you alone. The, Lord, the lessons that the Lord are teaching us are lessons that are meant for every one of us. He means for all of His children specifically to rejoice in them, to praise Him when these deliverances come. And so we ought to give testimony to that. We should not let these memories fade. We should retell the stories often. And it never gets old hearing how the Lord redeems people out of sin and into His family, out of deadness into life, out of darkness into light, out of condemnation into pardon and acceptance and adoption and new life. Every deliverance ought to give us that kind of joy. And, and it bears witness, it says, to the nations. Even the nations say, the Lord has done great things for them. And then, and then the psalmist says, you know what? We sang of that restoration too. We weren't going to let the nations be the only ones that say the Lord has done great things. Now we're going to take that chorus up for ourselves. And, and that's the song in, in verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. And so the psalmist has, has the memory vividly in his mind. I remember it, Lord. I, I remember that. I remember what it was like coming out of Babylon in captivity. Whether it was deliverance from a siege or, or famine, whether it was deliverance even from going after other gods, whatever it was, there was a deliverance. And the psalmist says, I, I remember that. I, I recall that. I know what it's like to be delivered. And then suddenly from the past, the psalmist comes back into the presence, the present which needs deliverance just as much now as it did then. And the memory, as I've already mentioned, becomes a prayer. The memory becomes a prayer. And the prayer is very simple. It comes with two pretty powerful illustrations. Look at verse number four with me. He says, and again, this is the, the beginning of the prayer, restore our fortunes. O oh Lord. Now look at that language. Go back up to verse number one again. Go back to verse number one. Right after the label of the psalm is given, it's a psalm of ascent, right? It's, we know what those are by now. It's, it's the people literally ascending their way to the tabernacle, to the temple, going to Jerusalem, singing these songs of deliverance. The pilgrims are singing this way on the way to Jerusalem. They say, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Now that memory has been taken fully into the heart of the psalmist. And he just blurts out in prayer, Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Do it again, Lord. I remember when you did it before. I can remember that. I never thought I'd open my eyes again without tears. But you did it. You filled my heart, my mouth with laughter. You filled my, my tongue with praise. You filled my days with joy. Do it again, God. Please do it again. He's pleading with God here. And he gives us two pictures in mind for what he wants the Lord to do. The first one is interesting. Look in verse number 4. In verse number 4 he says, Like streams in the Negev, the Negev, the south country, uh, was a very dry, a very parched desert. It was the very south of Judah. Touches the wilderness there in Sinai. It's the wilderness, okay? So he's describing the summer and it's dry. And all those places where previously those winter streams, that winter rain had ran, where the, 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 the wadis flowed are, are just dried and, and they're cracked. They're just basically gutters on the floor of the desert. And the psalmist is thinking, 
That's where I am right now. I'm in the summer. I'm in the Negev. It is dry as a bone. There is not a green branch in sight anywhere. There's no grass. There's no, there's no sign of life. But when the winter rain comes, those gullies are going to overflow with water. And almost overnight, grass is going to sprout up. Flowers are going to grow up all around these ditches. And he's saying, Lord, would you do that in my life? Because now I feel like I'm in the Negev in the middle of the summer. And I need those winter rains to flow. I need to see some green grass and some flowers. And it needs to be a place where I can get a drink of water. That's a pretty vivid, vivid picture, in my opinion. You know, you never ever get to a point in your Christian walk, in your life, where you don't have to cry that out to God. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how many years you've been walking, whether that's 20 or 50 or even 70 years. You don't get to a point in your walk where you don't need to cry that out to God. And is it not kind... Isn't it kind that the Lord says, okay, pilgrims, on, on the way to worship, on the way to Jerusalem as you're going up, some of you, your souls are dry as the Negev in the summer, so you sing this song to me and you pray that I'll make the waters flow again. And who knows, I may fill your mouth with laughter and joy when you least expect it. And then the image switches and you see there in verses 5 and repeated and elaborated there in verse 6. Those who sow in tears, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Now we kind of go to this second picture, the second word picture here. He gives us kind of a farming metaphor, right? And if you've grown up anywhere around here or in that type of environment, you know what an act of faith farming is, right? I mean, the ground is prepared, the seed is planted, you've worked hard, all those preparations have been taken, but the crop, what happens is up to things that are entirely beyond your control whatsoever. Too little rain, too much rain. Right? Rain at the right time, rain at the wrong time. Makes a huge difference. And the farmer has to work, and he has to work, and he has to work some more, and then he has to pray and pray and wait. But there's something that's layered on top of that agricultural metaphor there. It's not just sowing and waiting to reap. How is he sowing? He's sowing in tears. What does that mean? What, what does it mean that the believer is faithfully going about his work, her work, doing the Lord's business, doing the Lord's bidding, doing what they can to take care of their family, but their tears are flowing, their hope is quenched. The psalmist is saying, Lord, though we are now sowing in tears, would you give us a harvest that comes with joy? And then the last verse, he elaborates on that. Look at verse number 6. It says, He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. It's not a maybe. It says that he will come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. It's a statement of faith. It's a statement of hope. Wherever you are, this is a statement of hope. It is also absolutely true for every single believer. You can sow in this world with tears, but you will reap in the world to come. This psalmist is hoping for that, to be, that prayer to be answered here. For the Lord to give us just a little foretaste of what's coming. And so he prays. And so he hopes. So he remembers. It's a memory so powerful of a rescue that was so dramatic that he had to, to pinch himself to believe that he was awake. And then he wondered, is it possible that the Lord, that, that God could do this all over again? And so he prayed. Lord, would you please do it again? I hope you hear that word this morning. 
however dry and however parched your soul is today, whatever desert you have been walking through, whatever despair you have been experiencing, whatever trial or difficulty or obstacle has been placed in your way. That should be your prayer. Is it possible that the Lord could do it all over again? Recalling a time when He has been good to you, when He was so good to you that it felt like a dream, that you had to pinch yourself to see if you were awake. And let me just say this as I close. If this Old Testament believer, written, I don't know, maybe some 500 years before your Savior walked this earth, could pray that with that kind of faith and with that kind of hope, with no Messiah yet in sight, are you going to let Him outdo you? Are you going to let Him outtrust you, knowing the redemptive story, knowing the mystery revealed, knowing how God worked it all out, knowing that we're on this side of the cross? Will he really have more faith than we do that God is going to keep his word? I mean, you, you, have, you have seen the Son of God spill his own blood for your hope and for your joy. Will you not have greater hope. Church, this psalm does nothing to assure us that we will not experience these kind of hard moments in life. If you've been around enough, enough, you know that. But it does promise us this, and please hear me this morning. It promises us when we face those kinds of things, we do not face them without hope, without the prospect of joy that we remember being experienced again. The best news of all, this is God's word. This is not Bo's word. This is not my word. This is God's word, which means that you can believe it. It means that you can, can pray it. And if you can remember it, then you can pray it. Then you can have hope that God is moving, even when you can't hear it, when you can't see it, that you know that he is good even in the midst of the desert. I pray that you would remember that this morning and that you would pray that with me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit because we know that there are circumstances in life, God, when we know that, 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 that it, it makes this word, that, that your word that is inspired, that your word that, that, it, that is an errant God, that is infallible God, that is, that is all-sufficient, that is all-powerful, that is perfect and practical in our lives. God, that there are things in life that just makes us, makes that seem just so far away, God. But I pray through your spirit that indwells every single believer, God, that you would help us to know that because of what Christ did on the cross, because of his sacrifice, living a perfect life, dying a death that we deserved, God, and your acceptance of that and, and raising him into new life, God, that we do have an empty tomb, not simply a Savior hanging on a cross, God, that we have great hope. May we place our hope in Christ alone, God with all the distractions, with all the hindrances, with all the things that tries to blind our eyes, God. May our hope be in Jesus and what you have done, what you're doing for us, God, and what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.